pieces. So thank you so much. Who's next? Sharing your names, your role, you're in what program, and a little bit about your research interests. Yeah, I can go next. Uh, my name is Alexander Pittman. I'm a first year doctoral student uh, in teaching and learning in the Messy program. Uh, my research interest is in um, uh, how black, uh, I should say, um, males of color, adolescent males of color develop their academic uh, identity. Um, how they see themselves fitting in um, to K through 12 education, but my background is in uh, high school teaching, so really in secondary education. And then also if there's any um, correlation between uh, the development of the academic identity and the lack of uh, uh, African American male professors at major universities. Thank you. Thank you. Nice. Nice to meet you. Welcome to Ohio. Yeah. Who's next? Um, I can go. Hi, I'm Chelsea. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a first year doctoral student in higher education and student affairs, and I'm interested in uh, broadly critical approaches to trauma in higher education and specifically how trauma might look different based on identity. I'm happy to be here and I do have to turn off my camera at some point so that I can make my lunch but I'm excited to be a part of the conversation. I can go next. Um, so my name is Sydney. I am actually just a first year master's student so I do not have a research um, project yet. Um, However, I was involved in undergrad with Onia Okawobi doing a study and coding interviews for her um, related to like um, racial battle fatigue and also um, like utilization of folks of color in workspaces um, and like how, if were they followed up, were they used to fill a quota? Like we were looking into all that through um, qualitative interviews. So we were interviewing pastors, healthcare workers, and those that are in academia, like assistant professors. So that was a really fantastic experience that I had um, in undergrad. And I hope that I can use that to develop some of the work that I do now that I'm in master's. And so I can go next. Uh, so my name is Jonathan Howe. I'm a third year doctoral candidate in the higher ed student affairs program. Uh, my research interests are primarily looking at black male student athlete identity and identity development. I'm in a black male student athlete, but I also look at um, racial diversity within um, college athletics as well. I can go. Uh, my name is Amari Dryden. I'm a first year master's student in the higher education and student affairs program. Uh, my GA is in the career counseling and support services office and research interests that I haven't actually even done yet, um, but is working with Native American students and their experiences in higher education and then also student athletes in helping them in their transition from high school to college to a career. I can go next. Uh, I'm also a first, oh, my name's Charlie. I'm also a first year master's student uh, in the HESA program. And I don't quite have any research interest yet, but I'm in Penny's cl class and we're narrowing that down right now. So hopefully soon I'll have research interest coming. I guess we're doing introductions. Yes, Rosita, we are. They, we're doing name, your role, and then a word or two about your research. And it's really nice to see you. Yes, it's nice to be seen and not viewed, um, <laughs> as my grandmother would say. Um, I'm Rhodesia, and I am a postdoc here in EHE. Um, I am in the Educational Studies Department, specifically Education Policy. I'll be working um, with CallLab regarding um, in vivo um, training, and my research looks at policy and how it um, either creates and or exacerbates um, pre-existing and equitable conditions for students with disabilities as well as uh, students of color. 
grades K through 12, to be specific. So <laughs> I'm not higher ed. <laughs> Uh, I think, uh, all right, I, 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 I will assume it's my turn. My name is Tatiana Suspitsina. I'm Associate Professor in Higher Education Student Affairs Program. It's great to see some of the uh, far advanced folks like Jonathan and Bakari and E, whom I haven't seen in a while. Um, my research interests relate to uh, primarily discourse analysis of different kinds and to in application to internationalization um, from a critical perspective, from a critical post-colonial and post-structuralist perspective. And also, it also connects to larger issues of policy and uh, uh, American position taking uh, in the uh, market of educational services, in the global market of educational services. Um, I'm very excited to be here. Qual qualitative lab is something that appeared in my dreams many, many times uh, in, uh, in my uh, time at OSU. Uh, I think it's, it's a great um, start. It's a great initiative. And uh, Penny, I welcome you and I salute you because um, we have such a... Um, well, we have a strong uh, presence of quantitative methods and qualitative methodologies have been always a kind of a, as a, an afterthought um, in many, um, I shouldn't say courses, but in, in programs. And I think having a center where people can come and talk and leave through their data collection analysis uh, is just amazing. It's an amazing, it's gonna be an amazing space. Thank you so much. I think, uh, Alexander, did you? Yes. Do you want, would you like to introduce yourself? Or just, uh, I think, just going to, oh, you are. You yeah, I was gonna say I did. Yeah. I'm sorry, I had to stop my video for a second. Oh, but, uh, you were good, I just didn't wanna forget anybody. I'm so glad you did and you kicked it off um, earlier, thank you. Yeah, um, no problem at all, no problem. Thank you. Jen, we uh, welcome. We just went around and all shared our name, where we are from in our program, and a short word or two about your research interests, if you would like. That sure. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep my um, video off because um, I am not dressed properly. Uh, and so and, um, I'm Jen Wong, I'm an associate professor in human sciences. And so I'm predominantly trained as a quantitative person, but I've just gotten into more in terms of qualitative research. And so I'm just really interested in learning what um, this group has to offer. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody for being here. We are so glad that you're here. So we are going to uh, quickly share the introduction of our fabulous speaker. Uh, so I am going to toggle through and quickly, uh, hopefully, do, ah, there we go, housekeeping. So we just, little housekeeping keep your microphone off your video are welcome to be on or off whatever you would like and i'd like to i'm so glad that we were able to do introductions hey see what happens when you use house <laughs> somebody else's um marketing gave me this uh template so um we are going to do uh, welcome and housekeeping, and then an introduction of our fabulous speaker. So here we are. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Bakari, uh, and Bakari is going to do the welcome and introduction. Absolutely. So uh, first off, thank you everyone for coming out and being here with us here virtually here this afternoon for our call lunch series. I'm going to be introducing Dr. Kwame Ajayman. He is an associate professor of sports management in the Department of Human Services. Prior to arriving at the Ohio State University, he served seven years at Louisiana State University under promotion and tenure in 2018, and one year at Eastern Kentucky University as an assistant professor. He also spent the spring 2019 quarter as a visiting professor at UC, UC Davis Graduate School of Management. As a leader in the area of organizations and racial justice, 
And Gaiman, Dr. Gaiman has consulted both professional athletes and professional sports organizations on topics such as race and leading social change in the community. His upcoming book, Under Contract with Cornell University, an IOR Press examines and explains how organizations can support and positively impact underserved populations. He, he highlights the work of the National Basketball Association and its member organizations. Dr. Gaiman has published 30 peer-reviewed journal articles in various journals, including the Journal of Management Inquiry, Journal of Sport, Man Sport Management, Sports Management Review, Journal of African American Studies, International Journal of Sport Management, and the and International Review of the Sociology, Sociology of Sport, among others. He is also the Deputy Editor, editor for Sport Ma Business Management and International Journal and serves on several editorial boards, including Sociology of Sport Journal, International Journal of Sport Communication, Journal of Amateur Sport, and International Journal of Sport Management. So without further ado, Dr. Kwame Egeman. Well, thanks for having me, y'all. Um, I'm going to share my screen as well. <clears throat> Let's see. Can you all see that? Okay. All right. So, yeah, <laughs> let me turn that off. <laughs> All right, so yeah, thank you all. Thanks for that introduction, Bakari. Thanks for having me. Um, I didn't know I was uh, kicking off this series, so, so <laughs> I guess the pressure, right? But today we'll be talking about a topic that's uh, important to me that I've uh, done research on dating back to 2010 when my original uh, papers during my uh, PhD, and that's uh, athlete activism. Um, <clears throat> so as Bakari mentioned, uh, I'm associate professor here. I'm in my second year uh, here as an associate professor after uh, spending seven years at Louisiana State University. Uh, so thank you all again for inviting me for this important uh, conversation. So to begin, I'm going to give kind of a background of my, my research, um, my research influences and uh, my research agenda kind of give you basically an understanding of how I came to this topic of uh, athlete activism and how this fits within my overall research agenda. And we'll get into the brief uh, presentation of the topic. So I would say that uh, my academic training in three different areas has really uh, contributed a lot to my, um, my research agenda. So I did my undergrad in political science at the University of Oklahoma. And this really gave me an understanding of social policy um, institutions, I utilize uh, institutional theory in a lot of my, my research, and I um, combine that with critical race theory and understanding of the issues that I, that I research, <clears throat> and also gave me an understanding of how, you know, governments affect people, right, and how, in turn, people can um, impact government and policy, hence the notion of athlete activism. And then transition to higher education and administration at the University of Oklahoma, same program that uh, Penny taught in for many years. And uh, we had a focus on intercollegiate athletics administration and I was in that program. So this provided me understanding of theories and concepts related to organizational behavior and in addition to other, other um, issues, uh, particularly as it relates, of course, to the college and university setting. Then went on to Texas A&M University where I studied uh, sport management for my PhD. Um, this gave me more research competency while also a uh, better understanding the business and social aspects of the spectator sport industry. So uh, this is all contributed to my uh, research and um, in the most broadest terms, it's at the intersection of sports business and society. But in particular, I'm interested in questions related to agents such as athlete activism, activists, institutions, and institutional change. And again, um, I rely upon institutional theory, which is a organizational theory utilized a lot in um, among sociology scholars, uh, management scholars, amongst a host of others, and then critical race theory, which I was introduced to um, by my PhD advisor at Texas A&M. So to better understand my research questions, as you can see right there, I study the norms within organizations, systems, and institutions. 
So to kind of give you a, a little snapshot of some of the things that I've you know worked on and you know my past. So I've uh, my work resides within uh, a number of different uh, levels of analysis. So for instance, at the macro level, a uh, paper that I recently um, is in press right now got accepted. Um, looks at the institutional level. When we think about notions of institutional racism and racialized policies and laws, and we examine the the sport industry. So if you look at the sport industry, right? If you look on the field, number in particular black um, football and, and basketball, uh, which particularly see you know black men. But you go higher up, you don't see that many people that look like myself. So for instance, in the NBA, uh, one of the organizations I study a lot in my book is on. There's only one um, owner that's of color, and that's Michael Jordan, right? And then the, in the NFL, I think there's one person of color, an in, uh, Indian owner for the Jacksonville Jaguars. And even below that, when we think about the C-suite positions, executives, they're mostly white. And we argue in this paper, a lot of this has to do with the whole notion of unpaid internships, which we, which we um, examine in this paper. Think about myself, I couldn't work an unpaid internship during the summer. And the people that could are more likely to be white um, come from privilege and have money, so they have that on their resume, and then all of a sudden they're able to get these these jobs and they move up the ladder in the corporate world, as opposed to um, people like myself and other people of color. Maybe we can get an internship at the local high school because you know that's all we can afford because our parents can afford to pay, you know, um, to go off to LA or to New York to work at the NBA league office or, or something of that sort. So we we argue that this is the reason for the lack of racial and ethnic diversity in the sport industry when we think about the C-suite. Um, also, I've also done research at the MESO organizational level when we think about individual organizations within sports um, and the experiences of uh, you know, workers, black workers, people of color workers, um, the experiences of uh, black male athletes in schools. Uh, one of my um, papers, I think it's uh, my most often cited paper, uh, deals with the experiences of black athletes in college athletics. And their whole, um, I guess they're also their understanding of athlete activism. And then more into the topic that we'll be discussing today, the micro level, when we think about issues of athlete activism and then individual social responsibility, which was the topic of my, uh, my PhD dissertation, really looking at, you know, the notion, the idea of whether black athletes have this responsibility to speak up given the history of um, black athletes and the role that they've played historically in uh, the civil rights movement dating back to the 1960s, even before, and then even in the present present day. So, which brings me to the topic, right, of this whole idea of Black athletes and activism, and kind of, I want to talk about then and now, and I'm going to go through a number of ways of activism that we've seen throughout time, and I discussed this in a more recent article um, that was published in Organization, and I interviewed critical sports journalist Dave Zirin, and we kind of um, we discussed uh, this idea of sport as a site for social for, for social change, particularly as it pertains to race. So, if we look back and we think about Wave One, as you can see right here, early 1900s to 1945, <clears throat> this was characterized by as you see right there, individual athletes such as Jack Johnson, who was a boxer, or Paul Robinson, a football player, and then Joe Lewis, a boxer. And then also individual leagues such as the Negro Leagues and then HBCUs. And essentially these individuals and leagues at the time, they just wanted to fight uh, for recognition and legitimacy within the whole, the larger scheme of sports and society as a whole. Then we transitioned to wave two, which was the 1946 to the early to mid 1960s. And I really think about this, um, this wave as, you know, breaking the barrier. That's why I've highlighted names such as Jackie Robinson and Thea Gibson, a graduate um, of an HBCU. So then we moved to wave three, which was fueled by the civil rights movement and the rise of black power. And um, I want to even go back to this picture uh, before on the left right there. Uh, to the left, you see uh, Bill Russell, then Muhammad Ali, uh, Jim Brown there in the center, and then Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, then known as Lou Alcindor. And they were supporting Muhammad Ali at the time for his refusal to be drafted into the to the military. So if we go back to wave three, um, these athletes were demanding dignity and respect and social justice. You think about the 1968 Olympics, right? Um, uh, consider how uh, Harry Edwards, who formed 
the uh, at the Office for Civil Rights and Justice or something of that sort, Olympic Project for Civil Rights and Justice at the time. And he's the one that organized Tommy Smith and John Carlos. So if you think about that, that picture that we still see today of Tommy Smith and John Carlos holding up their fists at the Olympic stand, he's the one that organized that. And um, this was a monumental moment uh, in 1968. And it was kind of interesting because at the time they were kind of, uh, you know, they were kicked out of the Olympics, right? And, but now they're looked at as heroes. And you fast forward to 2016, 2017, you know, Colin Kaepernick, who's been, you know, he's been out of the league, he hasn't been able to get a job. So you wonder in 50, 60 years, are we gonna look at Colin Kaepernick differently than many people look at him now in the same way that we look at John Carlos and Tommy Smith today. So then we had this period of stagnation. So uh, from the 1970s to early 2010s, uh, we didn't really see a lot of uh, black male athlete activism or activism in general coming from athletes. And this was because um, of some modest changes that we saw uh, inclusion that we saw among um, these professional sports leagues, college leagues. So we had uh, USC, for, uh, I talk about this in my dissertation, there was a, a running back by the name of Sam Cunningham. So the West, uh, West Coast integrated before, you know, down South and other places, right? And USC had this running back named Sam Cunningham and they played Alabama who hadn't in integrated yet. And Sam Cunningham, um, I mean, he just run, he just like ran all over Alabama. And it wasn't until then that uh, Bear Bryant at the time, he was like, you know, go get me one of them boys, you know. And then all of a sudden now we see a different landscape in the SEC as, we, as opposed to what we saw in the 1960s. Um, but we, outside of that, we really didn't see a number of activists. Uh, there was Craig Hodges who in 1991, who was calling for a boycott of the NBA Finals, the Chicago Bulls and the LA Lakers. Uh, he came to Michael Jordan and Magic Johnson and said, let's boycott because of the shooting of Rodney King that year in Los Angeles. Uh, we had Mahmoud Abdul Raouf, um, who didn't want to stand for the national anthem in the NBA. I think this was around 1994, 1995. But outside of that, we really, there's not many cases of athlete activism. So this is a period of, uh, you know, OJ Simpson, Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods, um, uh, not wanting to, I guess, offend anybody that was going to, you know, maybe buy their shoes or buy into their brand and they didn't want to impact their brand. So William Rowan, who I had a chance to meet um, 2009 at a conference, he had written a book, The $40 Million Slaves, and he talked about this time and how Black athletes have abdicated their responsibility with, in their community with treason and its vigor. It's a quote as well that I, I went back to, I had to go get for my dissertation because it talks about the black athlete during this time period and how they were just different from time period before and how um, money and other factors really played into this. And then wave four, uh, 2014 to the present. I say 2014 because um, think back to what happened in that year was Trayvon Martin and um, that infamous picture again of the Miami Heat that they took with uh, with us coaches as well with the hoodies on in remembrance of Trayvon Martin. And then since then we've seen a number of different athlete activism uh, come to the forefront again like we saw many decades ago. And this was in, as you see right there in response to the unjustified killings and treatment of black Americans by police officers we have a number of examples such as LeBron James, Colin Kaepernick, and also a number of WNBA players such as, um, you know, her name is blanking on me right now, she plays for the Minnesota Lynx. But she, I mean, she went above and beyond, I believe, and she actually, you know, she took up criminal justice reform and she was able to help get this guy out of prison, Jonathan Irons, I believe his name is. And she's, she took, you know, a couple of seasons off of the WNBA. So uh, a different, what's different about these athletes as opposed to those that existed that engaged in athlete activism many decades ago was that these individuals are looked at more as like many corporate entities. They are their own business in their own right. So for instance, in a paper that I published, uh, I think it was in 2011 um, in the Journal of Management Inquiry, I referenced a line that Jay-Z said in one of his songs. He says, I'm not a business man, I am a business man and I relate that to athletes as well 
um, today's athletes, when we think about these big time um, athletes such as LeBron James, Serena Williams, Venus Williams, Colin Kaepernick and others. So there's a number of questions um, that, um, that arise as a result of this, I guess, these athletes, again, finding their voice when they're with regard to athlete active activism. So they're realizing the power. So how should they use it? What ways can they use it? Well, you know, what different ways they, can they use it as opposed to what happened yesteryear, yesterday, decades ago? There's also questions of duality. So they have this platform and this privilege um, to be able, they have resources, a considerable amount of resor more resources than what um, activists, activists decades ago had, like such as, you know, John Carlos and Tommy Smith. But they're also, um, Black in the United States of America. And as we've seen on occasion, you know, there was a, a basketball player uh, for the Milwaukee Bucks. He was uh, getting something at CVS in Milwaukee. And I think he had double parked and he comes out and he's surrounded by 10, 10 police officers and is taken down or whatever. And we saw another case of, uh, I think, uh, can't remember his first name, but Blake, a tennis player who was, you know, taken down in New York. So just because these people are rich and have money doesn't um, doesn't mean that they're not going to they're they're not going to experience the same things as other black and brown people do. So there's this notion, this question of you know how they navigate that, and then also expectations and responsibility. And it's a question you know, I'd really like to you know discuss with the larger group is, do athlete black athletes have a responsibility given their history of speaking up and speaking out with regard to racial justice and equality. And you know how is that different from maybe you know white athletes? You know, there's a uh, my my friend Dave Zyron, the, the sports journalist. He recently wrote an article in um, the Nation, the magazine that he writes for. Uh, it's saying that it's time for white athletes to speak up. Um, you've seen some, a few in the NBA do it more recently, but they really haven't you know taken the stand or been standing with their black brothers and sisters. Um, during over these last few years, whenever we've seen this resurgence of athlete activism. And then lastly, nav navigating in internal and external pressures from their team. So uh, Dallas Cowboys, I, I grew up in Dallas and I'm a Cowboys fan. And, and uh, you think about Jerry Jones, who said back in uh, after Trump had you know made that comment about um, calling players SOBs. And he said, my players will stand. They will stand for the, the anthem. So how do you navigate that? And then those also the external pressures of the fans. Sorry, uh, there's been athletes who have uh, you know spoken up and they lost you know corporate dollars. They've had sponsorships taken away from them. So how do you how do you again how do you navigate that? So then uh, over the course of my ten years in academia, I recently uh, formed this formed this company, this consulting company, 68th Street. I had a chance to meet John Carlos a, nine, uh, a few years ago. And uh, he inspired the name because of that, um, what they did at the 1968 Olympics. So basically I just consult with individual athletes or anybody for that matter that kind of wants to lead movements, lead change and also organizations um, and help them um, with this process of um, making their organization more race, racially diverse and inclusive and not only looking at inclusivity, but you know, asking the question, what are we including them into as opposed to we can include them, but if it's a, a culture of white supremacy, it's not really doing them any, it's not doing black and brown people, um, it's not doing right by them. So we interrogate these questions in my, uh, my conversations with them and I utilize a design thinking and qualitative approach to you know, come to better understand the um, number of questions that I have for them and that we wrestle together as we come up with solutions for the organization. So that is it. So now I'll open to um, any questions that you guys may have or um, discussion about this whole topic of athlete activism. So if you don't have a question, I will. So it's more fun if you all have a question. <laughs> so. Well. I, I have a question, right? Um, so I am familiar with William C. Rowland's work. I got to meet him a couple years back as well. And one of the things that he talked about in his text, Forty Million Dollar Slaves, was that he felt that the 
for example, we talked about the Negro Leagues, right? And how having an independent black baseball organization, even though it was based on racial apartheid, created an industry for the black community. And in your research, have you found any black athletes who have kind of talked about branching out and creating their own sports league? Yeah, it's been a tough time. Um, a lot lately, as we've seen, um, I guess, black athletes growing tired of the power that these owners do have, particularly when we speak about the NFL. So there's been talks of uh, people, you know, like the thing about Ice Cube, right? You know, he started, he started his own league. Yes. Um, uh, Kyrie Irvin, he had brought up um, thoughts about starting their own league or branching off and being, being their own bosses. So uh, I don't think it's far-fetched. I think it's definitely, definitely there's the potential there. And if things keep on going the way they're going, I don't see it outside the realm of possibility um, within our lifetime, at least maybe not within the next few years, but within our lifetime. So just to um, look at that question of, you know, do black athletes have an ob obligation um, to use their platform to speak out about social justice uh, issues or, or police brutality or, or encourage voting or whatever the, um, the topic of the day is? Uh, I mean, the short answer I would say is yes, um, but um, at the same time, I mean, don't all Black people, uh, regardless of if they're athletes, like myself as a teacher, um, have an obligation. And then like going to white people, uh, in the NBA, you see this, it seems like you see this a little bit more, um, you know, white athletes uh, speaking out about this, uh, about the injustice, about police brutality. Um, and, you know, you have to wonder, is it because of the fact that you're a white athlete playing in a, 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 a sport that is, I don't know, I'd say 80% black. Um, because I was just reading actually a Yahoo article yesterday about baseball, a baseball player, a black baseball player said that the major league baseball is not black enough. And he wasn't talking about the percentage of black people uh, that play. He was talking about how um, he told a story to his teammates about being racially profiled and then it dawned on him that his teammates, they just couldn't, that, that story didn't resonate with him. And he told that story thinking that like, you know, all, all people would understand, especially my teammates would understand that, you know, this kind of thing happens all the time. It's, it's just, it's not just a, a, a one-off instance, but uh, he was kind of surprised um, at the reaction or maybe lack of reaction from his teammates. Um, so I don't know if that you know, answers the question at all, but it definitely just gives something to think about in terms of how each uh, sports league goes about, um, you know, addressing this because Colin Kaepernick was vilified year, a couple of years ago and, and now, you know, you see him in commercials and it's just, you know, I mean, it, it's not that hard to figure out why that the, you know, the public opinion has changed. And so now, like you said, now he's looked at more as a, as a hero as opposed to um, a villain. Uh, well, it depends on who you ask still. Yeah, definitely, <laughs> uh, definitely. For sure. So, I mean, I think Nike definitely saw an opportunity, a marketing opportunity. So we saw that when that commercial came out um, for them, uh, for Nike, their stock went down, but it was only short lived and then their stock rose considerably in the days after that. But when we think about white athletes, uh, you know, I even pose this question to my class. I'm teaching a class right now on leading change and I had them read that article by Dave Zirin. And then uh, some of the students in the class are former athletes or current athletes that, uh, that don't play football or basketball. They're like uh, lacrosse or volleyball. Many of them are white. And they, they speak on their own experience and they say one of the reasons why uh, they didn't speak up or they didn't approach their black teammates is because, and I hear this a lot even from non-athletes, that they were afraid, they were scared of saying the wrong thing. Um, they didn't want to be looked at as ignorant or they just didn't know what, what to say essentially. Um, but I think about um, athletes like, you know, Chris Long, who played in the NFL 
for a long period of time. And uh, he even has a, uh, as a nonprofit and does work in Africa, but he's been one of the foremost white athletes that I can think of that has spoken up about this. Uh, you think about, you know, Kyle Korver in the NBA, he wrote a uh, piece in, you um, wrote a piece in uh, the, what is it called? The Players' Tribune, you know, about, you know, why he's chosen to, you know, speak up. But when we think about the NBA versus the NFL, a point that I make, uh, you know, in my book and in conversation with class, the reason why you see it more in the NBA is because the the fan bases, a lot of this is driven by the market, as you probably would guess. The NBA's fans are uh, more left-leaning, more young, they're younger, um, they're in the inner city, as opposed to the NFL, whose fans are um, all over, but um, you do find more uh, less fans in the NFL that are going to be uh, younger and left leaning. So the NBA has more leeway to do those things. And then also you think you got to remember that NFL contracts are not guaranteed. So you do something, the NFL, they can cut you right then and there, as opposed to NBA contracts, they're guaranteed. So the NBA athletes feel a little bit more empowered as opposed to the NFL athletes. So um, those are just a couple of reasons why you do see a little bit more of this among the NBA as opposed to the NFL. And then when you brought up the whole idea, you brought up the point of the uh, MLB. The MLB has a lot of, uh, has a number of black people, black players, but they're black Latinx players and they don't have the same experience as a person um, that's grown up in America. And I even think about myself as a, as a black African, my experiences are much different than a person um, a black American who has an experience here of over 400 years, opposed to someone who just came here. My parents just came here in the 19, 19, 1970s and 1980s. So um, I think those, you know, you think about the NHL too, you know, they got a lot of blowback for not canceling games, but again, it's a league with not a lot of black players and they've struggled a lot with this whole idea of uh, diversity and racial inclusion because you are seeing more black people desiring to play hockey. Um, but yeah, all interesting questions. Uh, think about what Kobe Bryant, the late Kobe Bryant said before he unfortunately passed. And he said that um, you just got to do what's right, regardless of your color. Um, you just got to do what's right. And that's what spurred him later in his career to speak up about these issues. But he took the cue in early in his career from Michael Jordan. In a 2000 paper that I wrote, I said that one of the reasons why we see a lack of uh, um, activism from back, black athletes was because of Michael Jordan. You remember that commercial, some of you are maybe too young to remember, but uh, he had this uh, commercial, sometimes I dream, and it was be like Mike. And I related that to the athlete activism too. These athletes wanted to be just like Mike when it came to athlete activism. They weren't willing to engage because they saw their hero, the person that they that they you know regarded and you know held in high esteem, not engage in it. So why should I either? Um, and then you have, you know, nowadays, it's, a, it's definitely a little bit more, it's easier with you know, social media and, you know, after LeBron James and um, the, a number of WNBA players started on that path, we see a lot more of that today. So I think we're going to see more of it in the future. Could you talk, talk a little bit about your, so a call lab question, your research methodology approach to some of this research? And then also, how does your identity as a researcher, like what advice can, do you have for the scholars who are coming up as PhD, EDD, and master students as they think through their own choices? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. So personally, I had to just, I had to research something that was, uh, that was really of interest to me and personal so it wouldn't feel like actual work, right? Because as I research this, I don't feel like uh, like I hate doing this. I feel like it's a passion of mine. So I really, I really, you know, dig in to the work. So get something that you're really, you find uh, yourself passionate about is one thing I would suggest. In terms of my approach, I take my cue from what's happening um, in the world, in and around me. So we see these things happening right now with regard to athlete activism. Of course, it's a really, you know, sexy in vogue topic. To research now, but I think back to um, 2010, you know, this was before that last wave, athlete activism wasn't, you know, nobody was researching it. And uh, come to find out, me researching that was one of the reasons why um, I wasn't, um, 
I wasn't looked at for a number of jobs. You know, I, later in my, some people came to me that were on you know, committees and they said, you know, the, the committee thought that, you know, you researching this was too controversial. Um, you know, all this, you know, different type of things that, you know, we have to deal with as, you know, black and brown scholars or depending on what you research. So, you know, you know, definitely keep that in mind, but it goes back to if you're doing what you find that you're passionate about, it really doesn't matter. It ended up working out for me, right? You know, I'm at Ohio State or should I be Ohio State University. I'm still, you know, trying to get used to that. Um, but in terms of my approach, I, I try to make contacts with people within the leagues and organizations so I have a point of reference to know what's always going on and to try to bridge that that gap that we see between research and practice. So with me always having these uh, conversations with people um, such as Dave Zirin, the, the journalist, or people within the NBA and the NFL, I have kind of a pulse of what's going on. And I, I never go into a, a project assuming that I know the answer. So I think that also comes from my use of design thinking, which really centers the user and um, really wants to get at the answers collaboratively and with one another and not just myself coming and uh, you maybe utilizing a colonial approach and me giving them the answers we come to um, to the solution together. So I utilize that in my research and also with my consulting that I do. Have you or any of your colleagues looked at the, um, I guess, financial impact and the um, viewership impact of the NBA taking such a strong stance? Uh, you know, have people been turned off to Black Lives Matter being on the court, uh, to the commercials that they're showing? Um, I mean, the NBA has just been really out front about it, like right in your face. So I would assume to some people um, that makes them offended or turn off the TV. Do you have any or, or, or is there any research out there? I know it's, it's kind of a fluid situation because it's happening right now. Um, but, you know, is there anything of uh, research on that? Not sure if there's any uh, research on it as of yet, because like you said, it's kind of fluid and we're still going to see what happens. But if you, I do have colleagues that uh, research, do social media research and um, they look at like different hashtags or things people say. And we do see a lot of, um, people um, saying, well, I'll, I'll never watch a game again, or I'm done with the NBA, but we've been seeing that and hearing that for years, right? Because of the things that NBA players have been doing. And then again, I think those are people that uh, generally aren't NBA fans to begin with. Uh, they're, um, they're generally more conservative leaning. And like I mentioned earlier, the typical NBA fan is a little bit more left leaning and a younger, you know, younger population. So uh, right now it's just tough to study because um, especially whenever they first came back from the lockdown because games were happening um, early in the morning or late morning into the day when people were at work and then coming back home and the games were already over. So naturally the ratings were down. So the ratings have been down, but we're just not sure as of yet if it's because of um, the times that the games were being played or if it's because of, you know, having Black Lives Matter on the court, having the messages on their jerseys, um, Black Lives Matter and different uh, messages that, they, that they've been allowed to have since the restart. So I think it's gonna take some time for, um, for all that to kind of, you know, figure itself out. But I mean, of course, yeah, you do see, you know, people saying those things on Twitter or just in conversations. And you and I even had a, uh, a student in my class um, on our discussion board when we were talking about this, he was like, well, last I checked, um, the NBA is not a political organization. He just kind of went on this whole spiel and was basically just talking points from Fox News. So just, um, but yeah, so we do see that. We do see that kind of thing. And I'm, I'm sure we will see it, continue to see it, even in the NFL, because the NFL is saying that they're going to be more, I guess, in their words, um, progressive with regard to racial justice and equality after uh, Roger Goodell's apology to Colin Kaepernick saying that they held, that they handled that thing wrong. I wanted to ask about the massive level of your analysis, but in application to educational organizations, what should universities do in 
uh, places like Ohio State have, you know, pride themselves on long uh, athletic tradition and they recruit students of color um, and white students in uh, their high profile football and basketball programs. And so there's a, they're very, Ohio State is very proud of that. Um, what, what should the universities do? How would they participate in encouraging activism uh, of their student athletes or, I mean, the, the, the answer I'm looking forward is not to be afraid of um, af uh, student activism, but we know that um, universities encourage student leadership, but they're afraid of student activism. So my mm -hmm. question is about student activism specifically. Yeah, uh, we know that college athletics, particularly when we think about uh, men's basketball and football, it's a business now. It's, uh, it's, it's essentially, you know, semi-pro or pro, just like, you know, the other leagues. And these athletes uh, are muzzled for the most part. Uh, they really, um, there's a lot of fear out there to, um, to speak on these issues from an athletic standpoint from the athletes because one, they fear retribution from uh, maybe getting their scholarship taken away or, and or they fear not being able to go to the next level and being drafted or being looked at as a non-team -team player. So one of the things that I've uh, talked about, and I had a, a Zoom a webinar with a couple, with a few coaches more recently, I said they, they have to lead by example themselves. They have to do a better job of understanding these issues, um, not, not allow it to just be an issue for black and brown people or black athletes. So for instance, um, I'll give you an example. Uh, a couple weeks ago, um, LSU, a, a number of my former students at LSU, athlete, football guys, they, they held the protest and they were walking, they did a walk on campus. And in other cases with other teams, the coach was with them. But in this case, Coach O was not with them. And I was like, hmm, that's interesting. Like, you know, why is the coach not with them? But if you flash back a few weeks before, Coach O was on, uh, was on Fox News saying how President Trump had done a, such an amazing job and how he was just great and this and that. And uh, it turns out that Coach O didn't know about the protest. So I was talking to one of my former students and like, you know, everybody's giving Coach O crap and, and this and that, but he didn't know. I was like, well, there's a reason why he didn't know. He's lost trust of his athletes after he, after he had said that. And now he said that uh, he didn't know that black people were experiencing this. He's just a football guy and he had no idea about the experience of black, um, black people in America. So when I talk to you know, um, executives or coaches or leaders, I say, it's incumbent on you to you know, understand these issues, um, whether you're an athletic director or somebody in the senior staff, um, you have to become more knowledgeable and understand these issues so you can lead by example and give your athletes the kind of uh, trust that we didn't see in that LSU case. And I think if we see more of these leaders, corporate leaders, athletic leaders uh, speaking up, um, not only speaking up, but actually uh, doing as they say, I think we'll see a lot more um, athletes feeling more open about their activism because you know, after George Floyd got, um, was killed, we saw a number of corporate CEOs, we saw a number of statements that came out, you know, we support Black Lives Matter, yada, yada, yada. But shortly after we saw a number of these employees within those same companies saying, no, this is not the case. If Black Lives Matter, you, Black Lives Matter, you wouldn't have fired so-and-so or you wouldn't have had this an inclusive culture within this organization. So uh, it's really up to these leaders kind of, you know, set the tone. Also, um, I, I don't know, I don't want to continue asking questions, but if any, does anyone else have one, a question? Okay. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, sorry. Yeah. So just, just kind of the, the veggie back really quick, when you were talking about the errors of the different bl uh, black athletes and activism, you mentioned Joe Lewis. And I thought that was rather peculiar because many people argue that Joe Lewis and the way he handled himself in the media and public was representative of respectability politics because of the ire 
that uh, Jack Johnson drew in terms of his unapologetic blackness and, you know, of course, going around with white women, et cetera. So I just want to know if you could kind of maybe highlight why you included Joe Lewis in terms of someone that was considered a black uh, activist. Yeah, so I think there's different ways you can think about activists, right? So activists, especially in that day, doesn't have to deal with, you know, maybe holding a press conference or speaking on these issues. But activists can be such something as small as uh, taking on a white athlete who is, or going to Germany, right? And during that time and fighting and winning and overcoming the odds. And when we think about the thought about a black athlete at the time that they couldn't do certain things. So it was more so about them competing on a level that they weren't expected to compete on and not as opposed to them kind of being at the forefront or leading a protest or you know things like that is more so in that way just about being in the same space as these white athletes at the time and as we move forward when the athletes black athletes got that space and got that legitimacy i don't think those of course those same type of acts wouldn't be considered activist feats nowadays right. that makes sense okay. So I just wanted to um, bring into the conversation about uh, athletes attending HBCUs. We definitely see a trend in that, um, or very recent trend in that in the past, like I would say a couple of months. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you're familiar, you know, with Jamil Hill. Um, she wrote uh, about, um, you know, I think it was specifically high, highly recruited basketball and football players going to HBCUs to bring money to those um, institutions. And she got a lot of pushback uh, as being, I believe some people went as far to call her racist, um, which is crazy in my opinion, but it did happen. And so um, I'm just curious, you know, what are your, your thoughts on that um, in terms of, um, you know, for example, like, that that the football example at LSTU gave, if those students were at an HBCU, most likely the coach would have been aware, um, would have attended. A little bit different in the SEC, you know, you see Tommy Tuberville, I believe, is running for congressman in, in Alabama now after uh, after coaching, um, I think at Auburn. So you know, it's 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 a little bit different. You know, the SEC is kind of a political organization of itself when it comes to football, especially. Um, so I'm just curious, you know, your, your, your thoughts on, on that, you know, trying to um, encourage black athletes as young as high school to use their, their platform, their, their bodies um, to send a message uh, to the power structure. Um, you know, do you, how do you think that's effective? You, you know, what, what would have to happen for it to become, I guess, uh, more effective? Yeah, that is a trend that we've seen uh, more recently, as you alluded to, uh, particularly in, in basketball. And I think it's easier to do in basketball just because if you can get a couple few to go to a school that can transform the whole entire team, make it to the tournament, you know, all the dollars that, um, you know, in the NCAA tournament, um, it's a billion dollar maker. So that can change the fortunes of uh, HBCU just by getting to the tournament. It's a little bit harder to do in football because it's more of a team sport and you need a lot more, you know, pieces in place or whatever. But I think it's, I think it's, um, I think it's great that those athletes did that. Uh, if we do see more of that, that can indeed change the power structures that we see within the NCAA to kind of dismantle uh, what we what we see and experience today within college athletics. But I think more so than the players. Um, I think it's uh, also important to look at the parents because the parents a lot of times are influencing, influencing these decisions. You think about uh, whenever they hold, hold these you know, press conferences where the player selects the hat of the school that he's going to, in a number of cases, I mean, I think in one case in particular, an athlete chose a Florida hat and his mom, black mom, was, she was pissed off that she that he chose Florida as opposed to going to Alabama. And it's all because she felt that Alabama would give him the better opportunity to make it to the NFL. So it's not just the kids, it's the parents too that you have to consider because um, they, uh, the parents are the ones that these coaches are going to their homes and speaking to. Um, so if we can kind of influence the parents, 
I think we can see a lot more of what we've seen in recent months of these um, students going to HBCUs and to, in order to you know, change the landscape that we see today. There's so much more I want to talk about. I want to share with you all um, a couple things of, in terms of moving forward. But first, I would like to ask us all to thank Dr. Ajiman and congratulate him for the uh, amazing, just lifelong work that you've been doing and the importance that it holds moving forward. Today, with the scholar strike, certainly uh, both here in the US and Canada, but also moving forward, how important it is. So um, thank you. I do want to quickly mention um, the next series that we have coming up is uh, combination between ed studies work i'm working with laurie Patton davis and the qual lab to bring you this series of osu alums who will talk about unapologetic educational research addressing anti-blackness racism and white supremacy so we hope you join us for that there's it's on our website and uh bakari is working hard on getting us webinars going through osu big red tape and then uh with the qual lab lunches we have more for the series uh, certainly. And we also have a grad student board that is starting with Chelsea and Bakari working to make sure that your voice, what you want to see happen with the Qual Lab happens as well as to give you opportunities to actually engage in research yourself if you're interested in working on research projects and there's more to come. So I want to um, ask us all to say thank you, pay attention to time, but then also invite people as we would if we were in person to stick around, ask more questions of uh, Dr. Ajiman and uh, each other as well. So I thank you for taking time to come today and for helping us launch the very first Qual Lab Lunch. It was such a great series last year. I know you all asked for it to continue. So thank you uh, so much. I really appreciate it. So please stay on if you would like or, uh, or drop off, but we hope to see you again at the events all year long. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so glad. Let's just chat, you know, as you would if you were <laughs> still in the room together. Please. That was good. I appreciate it. Awesome. Looking forward, I didn't, um, I saw you, you're bringing